Today I'm going to be talking about Beneath the Remains, which is the third studio album by Sepultura. The album was released on April 7, 1989, and it is celebrating 35 years. I will be talking about how this is their first release on the Roadrunner Records label, how they chose Scott Burns as a producer, and the reasons for it, and there's some interesting trivia that links them to the band Obituary. I will be talking about all of that in addition to going through the songs on the album. Let's talk about some of the events leading up to this album. Sepultura was formed in 1984 by Max and Igor Cavalera. They were a thrash metal band, although many people say the first few albums were influential in black metal. This included an EP called Bestial Devastation and the full-length album called Morbid Visions. After that, they released their second studio album called Schizophrenia, and this was the first album with Andreas Kieser. On this album, they started to move towards a thrash metal type of sound. The album had a much better production value, and it started to get some attention overseas. Now they're ready for their follow-up album called Beneath the Remains, and they really wanted to make it big. The band thought they had to make this really great album. They had one shot, and if they didn't make it, they would have ended up being a small uh, thrash band that stayed in Brazil. The label, uh, Roadrunner Records, showed some interest in the band, so they decided to go for it. In 1988, Max Cavalier went to New York, and he spent the week there so he could meet with the heads of Roadrunner. The band was offered a seven-record deal, but the label was still unsure of them. Sepultura was still struggling to make ends meet. The original budget for the album was $8,000, but afterwards it cost twice as much. The band really wanted to make a difference, so they decided to approach Scott Burns to produce the album. He was somebody who had worked with death metal bands such as Obituary, Death, and Morbid Angel. Um, by the way, this is not the Obituary connection I was talking about before. I'll get to that pretty soon. Now, Scott Burns was pretty cool. He only charged them $2,000, which was much lower than what he usually charges, and he was curious about the country of Brazil. So the band decided to start recording this new uh, album. They started recording in uh, Rio de Janeiro in a studio called uh, Nas Nuvens Studio. Scott Burns was in Brazil with them, and he really uh, helped the band out. He brought some drum equipment with them, and... He brought some uh, Mesa Buggy amps to Brazil, and these were items of equipment that had not been available in that country at that time, and that really made a big difference in the sound quality. Let's talk about the album cover. I guess there's a little bit of controversy, but not too much. They chose artist Michael Whelan to do the cover art, but they originally wanted to use some artwork, which was called Blood Curdling Tales of Horror and the Macabre. Take a look at this image. It probably looks familiar because it was used on the back cover of A Book of Stories by H.P. Lovecraft, as well as the obituary album Cause of Death. But this was the artwork that the band Sepultura had their eyes on for Beneath the Remains. Igor Cavalera went as far as having part of his painting tattooed on his arm, but Roadrunner convinced the band to use a different painting, which was called Nightmare in Red. They thought that the dark background with the bright red color was a better fit for the music, and the band agreed but then a man named uh, Monty Connor, an executive from Roadrunner, sent the artwork that they originally wanted to the band Obituary, and they used it for their album Cause of Death, which would come out a year later in 1990. This caused uh, Igor Cavallara a lot of resentment, but I guess in the long run it didn't matter because both of these albums have gone down history to be thrash metal and death metal classics. Let's talk about the songs. All the lyrics were written by Max Cavalera and Andreas Kieser, with one exception. I'll get to that later. The music was composed by the band Sepultura. The band co consisted of Max Cavalera on guitar and vocals, Igor Cavalera on drums, and Andreas Kieser on lead guitar. Andreas also played the bass, but it was credited to Paolo Jr., the album starts with a title track called Beneath the Remains. The intro has some arpeggiated chords similar to the intro from Call of Cthulhu by Metallica, but this instrumental section is uh, much darker. The song then takes off with a lot of speed and aggression. The song describes the horrors of war and the things that a soldier must face while in battle. That was the idea behind uh, Beneath the Remains, as the song mentions, cities in ruins and mass mutilations. I think this is an awesome opening track because it has the clean intro, the heavy thrash metal guitar riffs, and the changing rhythms to make this a classic 
thrash metal song. This song is called Inner Self, and this one has a very uh, mid-paced chugging sound that is carried throughout the song. This is one of those songs that is so simple yet effective. Most of the song is played on the low E string, but still awesome. I like how this one is slower than the one before, so it was a nice contrast between the two songs, even though it does speed up at times. The song also has some awesome bass guitar interludes and some haunting spoken parts. I guess the lyrics can be interpreted in different ways, but I believe it's about living uh, the life you want to. Stronger Than Hate is next. This one is interesting because the lyrics were written by Kelly Schaefer of the death metal band Atheist. This also has uh, some guests such as John Tardy of Obituary and two members of the band Incubus, Scott Latour and Francis Howard. And let me also say, this is not that 2000s rock band Incubus, but a death metal band that now goes by the name of Aprobium, or Aprobium. However you say that, I'm not sure how you say that. Anyway, the song is awesome. Uh, it's a thrasher and uh, has what you would expect, including heavy guitar riffs and tempo changes. The song continues the ideas of inner self, talks about one who experiences feelings that are stronger than hate. It's an awesome uh, song. There's an awesome bass solo at the end of the song as well. The next song is a thrash classic. It's called Mass Hypnosis, and this one is very... Fast and aggressive, it has a cool galloping rhythm that was common with thrash metal, and also had uh, changing tempos. This was one of the faster and heavier songs on the album. The songs about the idea of mass hypnosis, where people believe the government and soldiers go to war who are blinded by their faith. The song has some awesome lead guitar solos by Andreas Kisser, and also has some cool uh, bass guitar interludes. That's something that they do on this album pretty often. I really like that uh, part of this or aspect of this album in general. Next is Sarcastic Existence. This song is about mental illness and isolation. I like this song. It has a longer instrumental section, and um, when the vocals come in, I got a slight like, crossover thrash feel. The guitar riffs are interesting. They're not the conventional thrash metal guitar riffs. They kind of remind me of something like Voivod would play. Um, the song still has that signature gallop. I think this song is kind of underrated. It's just a little experimental and has lots of layers of sound. This is followed by Slaves of Pain. According to the lyrics, the song is about being a victim, confined by something difficult to understand that doesn't have a solution, and your mind cannot conceive a way to escape the threat. I like the song. They do a good job with the use of the echo effect in the vocals, and they change up the rhythm, the rhythm just enough to keep the song interesting. Next is Lobotomy, and this song is about an unnamed hero who fights against the norms of society. This hero also fights the manipulative systems used to deceive people. It's also a killer song, as this entire album is solid. The song is fast and aggressive, and it's just a great thrasher. It is Hungry. The song has some interesting lyrics. The main idea behind the song comes about uh, greed and corruption and how people will do anything for power. The song is a classic. It has some guitar riffs that seem to be closer to death metal. I would say the song is just classic thrash and has all the components of a great thrash metal song. Yeah, I'm into it, Primitive Future. This is a short three-minute song, but very fast and powerful. Max does some stop-start vocals, and Andreas plays some interesting tones on his guitar. The drawing by Igor is also very intense. The lyrics are not very easy to interpret, but I understand them as being uh, able to go through life uh, doing what you want, not being able to change the things around you. So that is all. Let me know what you think of this album. Is it one of their best? Is it one of the most iconic fresh metal albums of the late 80s? Let me know in the comments section. I did a review of Arise a few years ago when it celebrated 30 years. So if you want to check that out, take a look at that right here. In the meantime, thanks for watching. Please uh, give this video a like. It helps me with the YouTube algorithm. Uh, please subscribe if you have not already. I do rock and metal reviews, rankings, and more. Thanks for watching. I will see you in the next one.